So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce the first distinguished visiting uh, scientist program talk. And um, it's been a great honor to host Professor Christian Rosamond in my lab. And he is the speaker today. Um, Christian is a really well-known uh, figure <coughs> or person, a uh, scientist studying uh, synaptic transmission throughout the, his career. And let me introduce his biography. So he is from Germany, and he originally studied pharmacology um, from Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany. Then after that, a little bit unusual, I think, at that time, he went over to the US to do his um, PhD at the Volum Institute with Gary Westbrook. And after that, uh, that's when I got to know him. He went to do a postdoc at the Salk Institute with Chuck Stevens. Um, yeah, this is way back in 1993. We we're just chatting almost 30 years ago. And then subsequently, he became a Helmholtz Fellow and moved to Germany in Göttingen at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry um, with uh, Dr. Alain Marty. And then he subsequently, uh, still staying at the MPI, Biophysical Chemistry, he became a principal investigator of um, Heisenberg Fellow. Um, and then in 2008, he moved to Baylor um, back to US, now this time in Texas, to take up an assistant professorship in the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics, um, and also in Department of Neuroscience. And then working through the ranks, he became a professor in 2008 at Baylor. And then soon after, he moved back to Germany, this time to Berlin at Charité, where he is uh, currently. Um, to take up a professorship and um, being involved in multiple um, uh, responsibilities at Charité. And um, he's currently a professor in the Center for Basic Sciences at the Institute of um, Neurophysiology. So apart from these very prestigious fellowships through which he's gained various positions, um, he's uh, been awarded many grants, uh, prestigious grants. And um, also since 2014, he's um, uh, a member of a board of trustees of Schramm Foundation in Essen, Germany. And since 2015, he's serving as a scientific advisory board member in the Department of Biomedicine in University of Basel. And um, for in recognition of his um, outstanding scientific contributions. In 2019, he was um, elected as a member of um, National Academy of Sciences Leopoldina um, in Germany, which is the highest scientific distinction um, bestowed by a German institution. And um, he's, as I mentioned, he's an expert in synaptic transmission. And he's really well known for his elegant work throughout his career. I think my very first um, strong impression was this um, uh, really highly cited um, 1993 science paper that he produced as a PhD student, um, taking advantage, sort of his advantage of his pharmacology background and um, really having an elegant method to estimate the diversity of um, presynaptic strengths, um, which is a method that's been used throughout um, I won't go into the details, but um, you will hear more from Christian. And um, I think my favorite is the, uh, his um, identification of um, cytoskeletal modulation of ion channel. And um, since then, he's been involved in regulation of neurotransmitter release. That's very crucial for accuracy of information transmission. And so without further ado, Christian, please. Well, uh, thank you, Yuki, for uh, introducing me so so graciously. Uh, um, so many honors. I <laughs> nice to hear about. Uh, yeah, I just thought. Uh, yeah, we we love the science. I think this is uh, always a, the great part. 
And, um, you know, I um, want to maybe start before I go into my research topic, would really like to thank uh, OIST um, to allow me to do my sabbatical here since last September in Yuki's lab. Um, and uh, this was done through the Distinguished, uh, Distinguished Visiting Scholar Program. Um, so again, thank you so much for making that possible for me to come here. Um, I particularly would like to thank uh, Jonas Fischer and his team uh, to, to help me go through the moving here part, which is, you know, uh, it's, 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 it was a quite an interesting adventure, not, not complicated, but very interesting, and it still remains to be. And, um, and yeah, it's a very it's a great honor to be in this in, a very stimulating environment, this very prestigious institute. And um, yeah, I'm still looking forward for three more months of, of interaction with you guys. So um, yeah, so what I uh, want to talk to you about is, uh, um, is really kind of at the core of what my laboratory is interested in, is how synapses actually communicate, how, what's, how do they actually do their job? And um, uh, the, uh, let me just maybe start a bit more broader. The brain, you know, uh, we all know, this is probably the most complicated structure in the universe. Uh, we know when we look at the anatomy of the human brain, people say there are approximately a thousand different sub areas within the brain executing various functions uh, uh, that we're performing every day when we think, when we sleep, when we eat, um, when we have feelings, etc. Uh, and that, of course, is mediated by um, a whole a large host of cells that underlie these structures. There are, um, of course, mainly to mention uh, the neurons uh, that are uh, astonishingly 86 billion neurons in the human brain. But interestingly, also, we see that the number of glia cells, and this is something that brought me here to, 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 for my visit, uh, make, make almost the same, up the same number of cells in the brain. And studying uh, synaptic transmission, we ha really have to start thinking about, not start thinking, I have to start thinking about it. Yuki is doing that for many years already what the glia is doing in the interaction and helping synapses to actually do what they're supposed to do. Now, this is just in, this is some statistics of the in human neocortex. Um, you, when you just look at, at a microliter of brain volume, you find in there not only about 40,000 neurons, but each of these neurons make approximately 15,000 synaptic connections to other neurons, and at the same time received a similar number of synapses are making this an incredible complex network of interactions. And we find in this microliter of brain volume, four kilometers of axon length, uh, which just tells you um, the, the um, complexity of interactions. And if you are um, just looking at <clears throat> like a cube that is about 2,000 times smaller of this one microliter, which is 0.5 nanoliter of volume, and you make a um, reconstruction of all the neurons and connections in the brain in this in this volume of cortex um, you can appreciate um, the complexity of these structures so you see here um, in blue axons later in cyan you will see the synapses um, we're just sort of diving into this tissue through a vessel see the synapses colored in cyan and um, it's just amazing to think about 80 by 80 by 80 micron sized uh, cube, how complex that structure is. Here you start seeing axons and a dendrite and the synaptic connections in between. Um, this is an individual synapse. And of course you can see there are in this cube about 80,000 of those connections. Um, and um, so as you can, you can think in a way that the brain is a humongous, um, <clears throat> humongous uh, computational uh, organ that enables us to communicate information ac across neurons, across synapses. So um, my interest has been, uh, you know, thinking of the brain, of course, you have to think about the, uh, the areas and neurons, how they're connected, how the neurons are electrically active. And I have been particularly interested in the synapses, how they actually 
convey that information from the presynaptic side to the postsynaptic side via um, action potential induced neurotransmitter release that in turn then activates postsynaptic receptors. So just a um, kind of a scheme of this, um, one of the hallmarks of synaptic transmission is really its incredible speed. Uh, but let me show you first what happens really at the synapse. We have a presynaptic depolarization induced by the incoming action potential. We have calcium channels sitting right next to it that open calcium fluxes in, and then you have fusion competent vesicles that are sort of sitting right next to the membrane awaiting for the, 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 their go signal. And this relates to the stop and go of my title. They're waiting for the go signal to then actually fuse with the plasma membrane, releasing its neurotransmitter content into the synaptic cleft, and then activating the postsynaptic uh, receptors um, to open its, its gate. Uh, so cation, cations in case of glutamate receptors sort of flow into the postsynaptic dendrite, resurrecting the ele presynaptic electrical activity as a postsynaptic depolarization. So here is just to show you the speed question. So when, when you look at function of neurons, electrophysiology is a really important technique to do this. You see here the presynaptic action potential uh, recorded from a, from a nerve terminal. And then you see uh, subsequently in the postsynaptic uh, membrane, either by uh, looking at co uh, current clamp recordings, the depolarization of the membrane, or when you look at uh, um, voltage clamp recordings and invert current, that occurs on really a, a, in a millisecond time scale. So if you then uh, blow this up uh, in terms of the time scale, you see here the presynaptic action potential, you see the presynaptic calcium current, and then you see the postsynaptic response. And you can start appreciating the speed between the presynaptic and the postsynaptic signal occurring within a millisecond or so. Um, depends a little bit on the synapse you're looking at, but this is very important because neurons fire in the brain at very, very high frequencies. And the precision of this firing of the neuron is an extremely valuable uh, information content. And so synapse's job is to, to maintain that preci temporal precision. Uh, and therefore, synapses have to be very, very fast. And so that's one of the things that fascinated me in this area. How can this cell biological process uh, of vesicle fusion induced by calcium influx uh, take place in a microsecond time scale. It's perhaps it's probably the most fast, the fastest cell biological process that I know of. But you know, given this diverse um, auditorium here at OIS, maybe someone comes up with something faster. I'm very curious to hear about it. But anyway, it's one of the fastest uh, things that happen in biology. Okay, so the other thing that you have to keep in mind with synaptic transmission is not only speed. But you also have to keep in mind that synapses are, um, uh, have, have a very, pre uh, very precious content that are easily be consumed, which are the synaptic vesicles. The, the presynaptic terminal in, in, in the nervous, central nervous system has only a few vesicles at hand, fusion-ready ready vesicles that can be easily consumed if you think of a fifth or sixth action potential. And then once those vesicles are gone, they need to be refilled. And so really is an issue of supply demand that the, that the, nerves, the presynaptic, nervous, presynaptic nerve terminal has to face. And as a result, the, when you look at ongoing firing of, of uh, synaptic transmission, you see that the amplitude of the response, for example, can go in the, into their knees if you stimulate them too strongly. And you see that, of course, in certain areas of the brain that you, you have a, not a steady response, but kind of a plastic or short-term plasticity response in synapses. Yet when you look at other synapses, you see different behavior. So there is versatility in the way how synapses communicate the action potential train. So the way I see it is, is just like they speak different dialects. Some synapses tend to facilitate, some tend to depress during the train. And this kind of code is, is imprinted in the a structural and molecular composition of the individual synapses. This is our working hypothesis, and there's more and more evidence for that, similar to that neuron have incredibly diverse structure and, and, and axons and dendrites, um, fire in very, very different paces. Synapses themselves are translating the, the action potential code into different types of dialects. 
um, as reflected by this versatility of um, train responses. And the other thing that the synapses are facing is a signal to noise issue. So when you make a vesicle fusion competent, when you make it ready for fusion, it has to be right there because you only have a fraction of a millisecond to release it. And you have to bring it into an energetic state that is kind of just waiting for this last blip of signal, which is a calcium influx. And that brings it into an energetic state where these vesicles can occasionally also fuse spontaneously. And that would create membrane noise where you see in absence of stimulation, you see these little blips of invert current which are caused by this so-called sp uh, spontaneous release. And if you remove certain proteins, for example, that we will talk about later, the snare complex, uh, that bind to the snare complex, if you remove this protein, you suddenly see that the synapse faces an incredible problem of producing too much noise by sort of preventing those vesicles to, um, to um, 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 not be not be released in absence of stimulation. This protein called is complex, and we've been also studying a lot in the in the laboratory. So, so there are things to keep in mind. Synapses, synaptic vesicles need to be kept in a certain energetic state, so that we have a maximal response when we give an action potential and minimal activity outside of this act, out of outside of this firing of presynaptic nerve terminals. And so this, this is a kind of a, um, a weighting of, of functions in the nerve system. We want to make the vesicle fusion efficient in their fusion properties so that they can fuse efficiently and fast, but don't make it too easy for them to fuse. Otherwise, you just get too much membrane noise. Good. So let's look at this on a, on a um, scheme again. What does it take to make a vesicle fusion competent and ready for fusion? So we have this calcium trigger. The vesicle sits right next to the membrane. We call this docking. Uh, they, they need to be brought down to the membrane, and they essentially touch the membrane. And also, we have to assemble a fusion apparatus so that, uh, for example, the, the forces that, needs, that are required to sort of break two membranes and make that two membranes into one, uh, that, that these forces are available, the energy for that is available, and that this this transition is, can be actually triggered by the influx of calcium. Now, now, the energy barrier for two membranes to fuse is extremely high. In normal cases, you probably would be taking spontaneously without any of this fusion apparatus years. And that's very good because otherwise our cells would const constantly disintegrate uh, through instability of the membrane. So membranes intrinsically are very stable. And so you need a catalytic machinery that makes this transition very, very easy and fast. And that's what I have been fascinated in. What, how can you build this machinery? So the system that we use in the lab to study is a very, very reduced system. It just sort of is the think, simplest connectivity you can think of. It's this kind of Robinson Crusoe situation. You have a single neuron growing on an island, and this neuron can only talk to itself. It has it forms uh, axons, it forms dendrites. You can see them here in the dendrites in blue. This is soma. And you see all that the axon forms hundreds of synaptic connections onto its own dendritic tree. And th with this system, we can study then synaptic transmission with a single patch pipette, very easy system. And, you know, Yuki uh, got also very famous when she was in, uh, uh, in Chuck Stevens' laboratory. She used this technology, in fact, to discover how um, synaptotactin, the calcium center, we will meet, mention this briefly later on, is actually operating uh, at this synapses. So she showed this in knockout mice for synaptotagmin uh, using this autaptic system. And, uh, you know, I'm also being very fond of this system because it's just very simple, very highly controllable to, to study the mechanisms of release. And um, so what we basically do is we do a simple, Pre, um, short somatic depolarization of the membrane from minus 70 millivolt to zero millivolt for just two milliseconds. And then along the uh, axon initial segment, you get an unclamped action potential, sort of distributing the electrical stimulus along the axon, and you're reaching all these hundreds of synapses at once, and then causing a synaptic response that you see here. And the beauty of the system is the response size you see here is, is quanti quantitatively dependent on 
uh, factors that we can all collect in our system. We can count the number of synapses. The more synapses, the larger the response. We can measure, have ways of measuring the number of fusion competent vesicles that these hundreds of synapses make all together. It's kind of a sum up. And this is so-called pool of readily uh, vesicle, releasable vesicles. And we can just simply do that by applying hypertonic solution to this neuron. Uh, and then if you look at the transient component of the response, these are all sort of these mini blip responses from individual vesicles summed up and uh, count them essentially by looking at the charge, uh, current charge that flows. And typically for these couple hundreds of synapses, we find like 5,000 fusion competent vesicles. So let's say you have 200 synapses and 5,000 um, 5, uh, fusion competent vesicles. We can make this quantification for each individual neuron. And we can put this, of course, in context to the synaptic response. And we can also look at the spontaneous release from this pool of vesicles. So when we have 5,000 vesicles available and we measure mini activity of five hertz, so five per second, that means each fusion competent vesicle that sits here fuses spontaneously every 1,000 seconds. So because rates, we can directly measure the rate of release of individual vesicles, both during stimuli and sp spontaneous, we have means of describing the energetic state of these vesicles in quite, uh, with quite high accuracy. And that allows us to study uh, essentially the machinery that underlies this process in great detail and find out what are all these factors, these proteins and so on, are doing to make this uh, release process uh, possible. So um, here is just to briefly mention how can we actually measure the efficacy of release itself from calcium triggered responses. A classical method is to do pad pulse stimulation. You give two action potentials right after each other. And then depending on whether the second response is smaller or bigger, we know that the release probability is high or low. This is just something that has to do with supply, demand, and calcium influx. But we can also directly measure it by quantifying the number of vesicles that are released by an action potential by the number of vesicles that are available. And we call this vesicular release probability. Again, something nailed down to the behavior of individual vesicles. So if you have 5,000 vesicles available and 500 are released here, we know that the probability of vesicle to fuse with an action potential is 10%. So it's essentially we know the property of the dice that is rolling when this action potential comes in. We say, okay, an action potential makes one out of 10 vesicles to fuse. And this is very important because we can now look at different synapses and we find at the, let's say, at the uh, cortical synapse that this likelihood is only 5%. While when we look at an auditory synopsis, might be the probability might be 15%. And so knowing about this probability of release helps us to understand why some synapses are uh, you know, depressing during trains of action potentials, while others are sort of showing facilitation. So the other thing that we really like to do is, <clears throat> is to um, manipulate the molecular content. So if you're really trying to understand how the apparatus of release itself works, we need to go after the proteins. And so for this, we've been, um, you know, initially, uh, you know, as uh, Yuki said, my, I started to use a lot of pharmacology to understand the synapses, develop tools to under, use these autopsies. But then uh, luckily I was also got in touch with people like Tom Sutorf or Niels Brose that actually made knockout mice for presynaptic proteins. And our system was perfectly designed to actually st study what's wrong with my synapse if I take this protein away. And so that's kind of what we've been doing a lot over the last decades, I would almost say. We use transgenic mice that lack essential components of the release machinery and then characterize the phenotype of this loss of function. But then we can go one step further. We can bring back the protein of interest using, in particular, antivirus. We like them a lot by uh, essentially reintroducing this protein using a virus. And then, um, for example, study mutations in these proteins or the concentration of these proteins and how it affects actually release. We can use also the system by putting in um, ex uh, reporters or manipulators of neuronal function. Here, for example, we do have a mixed culture of two different types of neurons. Uh, 
they have green nuclei and red synapses or red nuclei and green synapses. So you can study how neurons form connections with each other uh, uh, under controlled conditions. Uh, here is an example how we use this, uh, um, uh, this transducer, the, uh, the um, trans uh, manipulators of the electrical activity in our experiments. And brings me also to a second last technique that is important for us is electron microscopy, because synapses are functioning, but they also are structures. And the structure is obviously also involved in controlling function. So in this case, when uh, we had a visiting scientist, in this case was Eric Jorgensen, came to Berlin and they had been sort of trying to do the version Hoysan Ries 2.0, uh, sort of trying to capture synaptic events on a very uh, on a millisecond time scale using ultra uh, uh, electron microscopy. So the idea is to use a high pressure freezing device, uh, transfect neuron with a uh, general dopsin to control their firing property using uh, optogenetics, and then essentially stimulate an action potential milliseconds. Uh, before we freeze and arrest this, the structure in its, in its native state. And so then when you look at this electron micro microscope microgram, you see actually a fusing vesicle uh, in, the, in a central synapse, which is something that's very, very difficult to do if you do electron microscopy in absence of syncing with the activity of the neuron. So this has been an extremely powerful uh, novel technique that we've been um, utilizing now in the lab a lot. And the other thing that you can do is you can sort of look at these structures at the presynaptic membrane and the, and the position of these vesicles and sort of ask, okay, this one is directly attached to the membrane, we call this duct. And then there are other vesicles that are sort of close by. And then we give a single action potential. And then what we see, what, what happens with the, the number of vesicles we see. And we've, what we found is that only the number of vesicles that are directly attached to the membrane is reduced in the, in the profile, but not the dog tethered vesicle. So we know for a vesicle to be fusogenic, to be able to be released, it really has to attach to the membrane. And so that these are kind of tricks how you can use a system to um, understand its, its, its um, architectural uh, principles um, and, and how the positioning of these structures reflect function of these vesicles in the, in the presynaptic terminal. Um, here is just even more advanced thing that we're currently trying to do is using cryo electron microscopy, uh, which is much more native than even the high pressure freezing that I showed you. Um, here we basically use no staining, no, no heavy metals, no fixative, uh, really looking at native uh, membranes and uh, trying to identify a synapses why we are stimulating them electrically. And um, you might see this here, this is a synapse. And when you look at it carefully, you see little bumps here. And we, we think we don't have proof yet for this. This is all work in progress. But we think that we can actually resolve in this technique aim uh, fusion pits and uh, even postsynaptic receptors here in quite high resolution. And the long-term goal of this is that we break things down beyond vesicles and membranes that we actually start seeing the proteins that underlie these activities that we've been um, interested in. So this brings me to that level, uh, the protein, the, the core release machinery, which is going to be main focus of my data science here of my talk. Um, these are, this is a so famous snare complex. And the snare complex is a kind of bridging vesicle and plasma membrane. And this complex has to be formed so that vesicles are becoming fusion competent. We, it is thought that this, this, this complex is, uh, is providing the energy required for, the, for, the ener uh, for these that these two membranes fuse with, with, with each other. And before fusion, this so-called trans-snare complex, because two, uh, the two different membranes are involved. And after fusion, it's a so-called cis-snare complex, uh, where you, fusion has been uh, finished. And the trick here is how um, is the snare complex, how is the snare complex operating um, and how is it actually formed? So these are kind of big questions in the field. It's been studied for many, many years, but we still really don't understand this in, in much detail. So before vesicles come, come in close contact with the membrane, 
the snare proteins, syntaxin, SNAP25, and SNAP Brevin sort of float around and they are the separate membranes. And then you have, for example, syntaxin being controlled is a kind of a scavenging or, or like a, um, um, a um, adjunct protein, MUNC18. And then somehow uh, these membranes that inform the snare, trans snare complex. Uh, making the fusion, com fusion complex ready for, uh, for the calcium trigger. We also have to have a calcium sensor in here. And then when calcium comes in, these apparatus allows the, the merging of these two membranes. Okay, so here's just a little bit more detail about uh, syntaxin, which I'm mainly gonna talk about today is uh, syntaxin can be in different conform conformations. It has kind of a, the executive part, which is a red part, and the regulatory part, which is shown here in the N terminus and the HABC domain. And we have here among 18. So at the start, they form a complex, and then you have to come in with a vesicular snare protein VAM2 or synaptic brevin. And that sort of crawls around the um, snare motif. The two snare motifs sort of merge here at the N terminal part. Uh, but this is only possible when these, uh, when when the uh, regulatory domain of syntaxin can sort of open up here, and, and then eventually you have enough template that also SNAP25, which is shown here in green, is sort of joining the the complex. So at the end, you ending up with this trimeric uh, snare complex that forms overall these four bundles. And so then we have this, at the end, we end up with this complex of vesicle membrane, plasma membrane, and snare complexes. Uh, and that's kind of the fusion ready vesicle that awaits the calcium trigger. Of course, what is not shown here is the calcium sensor itself. We don't really know where it is exactly. It's also an interesting question. Um, and, um, but one thing that we can already do in our analysis uh, is to ask how many of those snare, snare complexes do we actually need for fusion to take place? Is it a single one? Do we need 10? Uh, and so using our genetic tools, we can address this simply by taking out, controlling the concentration of one of those key proteins, in this case, syntaxin, by controlling its amount in the synapse. And how do we do this? We take essentially knockouts, heterozygous mice, and then uh, knockdown approaches. So we, we reduce the concentration of the protein using also knockdown constructs and combine those. So essentially we, we do kind of a titration down of concentration of the protein in the synapse. You see it go gradually, the, the signal goes down uh, while the synapses maintains. And then we can look at these different concentrations, how synapses actually perform. What we find is that we look at, for example, the number of vesicles that are made are fusion competent, the so-called RRP charge, drops, of course, at some point to zero because we need the snares to make vesicles fusion competent. And But looking at the function and the relative concentration or relative expression, we sort of gain an idea about the the, 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 uh, the importance of the stoichiometry of this process. And we can also do the same game by looking at vesicular release probability, the likelihood of the, the, uh, the die throwing, what I told you about. And we can look at how, when we lower the concentration of syntaxin, that gradually the release probability drops. And from this, we, can, uh, we actually found that the slope of this process is approximately three. And that could be indicative that essentially there is a transition between vesicles uh, that maybe form one snare complex and multiples that causes an increase of the fusogenicity of those vesicles. And uh, basically illustrating here that we can utilize genetic molecular manipulations to understand better the process of fusion itself. So uh, this is just to show you the modular domains of syntaxin. I already told you this is the regulatory domains, which are sort of opening and closing, enabling the, 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 the business part of the snare domain to, uh, to be uh, inter interacting with the other snare proteins. And I don't want to, we've been working on this quite a lot. There's very interesting research done here, um, but, um, I want to mainly talk about to you about the executing domains here, the snare motif itself, uh, the linker region between the snare motif and the transmembrane domain. So the snare motif is where they form this bundle. 
Uh, and in between, we have a region, short region, which is uh, important for function. And then, of course, the, the, the membrane anchor. So um, this is what I mainly want to talk to you about, what we found in our uh, molecular structural analysis of this region, how that actually affects vesicles for in, in their fusion uh, properties. So just to show you this, we're talking about mainly this region here in the trans domain or in the system, cis structure, uh, this gray area here uh, is the linker region, this is the transmembrane domain, and that's the snare motif. And um, so the first thing that we did was to ask how important is the length of this structure? How is it, essentially the idea is how does the snare, mot snare complex couple to the membranes? Because some, they do something with, they may do something with the membranes. So it is on pulling on the membranes, making them sort of fuse or making them unstable or forming kind of dimples. This is something that we don't really know yet, but um, we thought let's just put a single, single tur helical turn, almost it's not even a full turn, by just putting GSG into the sequence. So we take the syntax and knock out mice. So we made them, so they are, the endogenous protein is gone. And then we replace it by wild type syntaxin or by mutant versions, for example, that contain additional three amino acids, either at the edge to the, trans, the snare motif or to the edge to the transmembrane domain. And then ask, what does this extension of that linker region does to release? And does the, posi the, extension, the position of that extension play a role in the fusion process itself? So we must say we were quite surprised to see how dramatic the effect was. <clears throat> I mean, extending the length, I, I thought this, I, I expected that something will happen. But if you look at the logarithmic scale, this is the release, this is the amplitude of the synaptic response, typically like five nano amp in our system. And that drops by a factor of um, 100 to 1,000 if we are um, inserting these three amino acids into this linker region. And so to our surprise, the biggest effect was actually putting this linker right next to the edge between the snare motif and the linker and not the linker and this transmembrane domain. And why, do, why was it a bit surprising? Because this region, this linker region here has lots of basic residues and we have the negative phospholipids here in the membrane. So by making this longer here, by pulling this out a little bit, we are moving these basic charges further away from the negatively charged phospholipids. We thought this would kill the response more likely, but it was actually the other way around. This was not so important. What was more important is to put extra distance between the snare motif and the, and the linker and the transmembrane domain, arguing that there must be some kind of spatial or mechanic uh, uh, process sort of force transduction that takes place when the snare complex sort of forms, zippers up up to the end, and then uh, somehow cre creates force to, the, to, to enable vesicle fusion. So we found that the fusion was essentially gone in this, in this mutant. And if you put this linker in, in here next to the transmembrane domain, we found that the release was larger reduced and more, also very interesting, the release was much, much slower. So this, uh, the release itself uh, slowed down by a factor of about 10. And this is something similar that actually Yuki found when she looked at the uh, knockout mice of synaptic tagman. So release itself became much, much slower. So clearly imprinted in the structure of the snare complex is, are the properties like the speed and the efficiency of the release process itself. The other thing that we found was quite surprising despite the fact that this mutant here had a way reduced evoked response and the release was slower, we found a vast increase in spontaneous release activity. So the opposite of what was happening with evoked response. So we see here now that the structure of this complex can go in both, can have impact in two, the two main types of uh, fusion, spontaneous and triggered, calcium triggered release in opposite directions. And keep in mind, we want in the synapse that Evoked release is maximal and spontaneous release is minimal, right? So to have a big signal to noise and signal to noise ratio. So the high spontaneous release activity is bad. And uh, so this tells you that intrinsically fusion is still possible, but we now actually made the release less favored because we can't really control when fusion occurs 
with our calcium trigger. And so we then said, okay, let's look at this linker region and what, what is happening in the linker region in terms of evoked and calcium triggered release. And by simply making single point mutations in these basic residues you see here. So a lot of basic residues just in this very short linker. And when we made individual mutations in these residues, we didn't see much of an impact in evoked release. If you make two or three or four mutations, then you start seeing a bigger and bigger effect on evoked release which is because in positive charges need to interact with the negative head groups of the phospholipid membrane. But single residue changes, that's what we do here, have a rather little impact on evoked response. But to our surprise, they could, they, depending on the position, they had dramatic effects on spontaneous release. So in particular, mutating the position 260 and making a reversal of the positive charge to a negative charge caused a drastic drop in spontaneous release activity, which was um, telling you again that this region is very, very sensitive to controlling the both evoked and, and spontaneous release activity. So we thought to look at this in a bit more careful, but one thing that um, Gülch, who was a, a postdoc in my laboratory when she did these experiments, Made, you know, we typically, when we use our viruses, we always look for gene expression levels for the viruses because we want to keep them all very similar so that we don't have these titration effects that I was telling you about, right? If you have too low concentration, then of course you get different phenotypes. So what she found, noticed is that the band of the syntaxin protein that we quantify for expression vary depending on with the mutation. You saw that the white type band has the highest molecular weight and if you, have, for example, have a mutation with a uh, 260, we start seeing a lower band and a kind of a middle band. And some mutations, even you see three different band sizes. And that is, was a surprise. Nobody had noticed this before. Um, for example, if you look at hex cells, so they're non-neuronal cell lines, and you express syntaxin, they all run at a lower band, okay? But if in neurons, actually the band height is higher, than in, 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 in cell lines, indicating that um, neurons make a, a post-translation modification to the syntaxin protein, somehow altering its structure. And in this case, we say, depending on the on specific basic residues in the linker region of, of syntaxin. So that was the discovery. Uh, we thought it's really worth um, um, following up, what's going on here? And how is this change in band pattern related to at all to what we observe as spontaneous release activity? So Gülchin sort of made up a, a code of, um, of um, um, band positions going from one to six, kind of arbitrary, giving them a number. One is the wild type band and six mm -hmm. is Newton, which has the strongest shift to, the, to, a, to a lower molecular weight. And she found that the band position was predominantly uh, important for mini frequency activity. So uh, band position one gave you the, the uh, lowest frequency and six the highest. Um, so clearly um, the post-translation modification has some, uh, is, causing, uh, is correlating very well to spontaneous release activity. So what, what's going on here? So, um, you know, a, one obvious way of changing molecular weight is, for example, to do uh, palmitylation of, of the protein. And there are indeed in the transmembrane domain of the snare of the syntaxin, there are two cysteines uh, rather close to our conspicuous um, lysine at position 260, which is a very important controlling amino acid for molecular weight. And so what we did, we individually mutated the cysteines, and um, also and compared that to mutation of the lysine okay. here. And what we found was that the white type band gradually decreased in amplitude from one mutation to double mutation. And the double mutation had a similar bandwidth than, the, than mutating this residue. And doing the combination of the uh, mutations did not further decrease the molecular weight. Um, so this clearly indicated to us that um, the, we have most likely an, a modification based on these cysteines in the transmembrane domain uh, 
um, uh, that is responsible for the shift in molecular weight. And so we, we independently test this within a quite complicated biochemical experiment. Uh, basically, um, you have um, here palmitolated residues uh, through a thio ester. You first block all the free um, um, cysteine groups in the protein. Then you cleave the thio ester with a reducing agency. And then the free SH group now is getting occupied by irreversible covalent bound of a biotin. Um, moiety, and then we can use this biotin moiety to, to be detected with strep avidine in our Western blot. And you can see here that the wild type protein has this bend uh, of palmit in, in extra bend that uh, we see with strep avidine. Sorry, it's a dirty, but that's the best we could do. We're not, not biochemists, uh, but you know, I, I, we could repeat it and the signal was clear, but it's not super, super clean. Um, and this band disappeared when we made either mutations in the, uh, in the lysine or when we mutated the cysteines in the transmembrane domain. So this band that we expected to see disappeared. Um, and uh, you can also see here the shift into the, in the molecular weight of syntaxin. So it's clear then, so from this we were convinced that permutulation of these transmembrane domain residues are uh, dependent on this basic residue. And so there are transfer races of palmitol groups that are sort of swimming in the membrane and they're sort of looking for motifs. Uh, one motif is of course the cysteine in the membrane, but they probably need also basic residues to actually dock on and then enable their ac enzymatic activity. So um, the question now is what does palmitolation does it directly? So we can test this by simply looking at the um, cysteine mutants themselves, not at this mutation, and compare them the phenotypes. So again, making the cysteine mutants individually or double didn't really affect the evoked response very much. But again, we saw a drastic reduction in spontaneous release activity. So clearly, palmitulation is required for maintaining a high level of um, spontaneous release activity in this uh, mammalian synapses. So just brings me to the end of my first part and I will have a few minutes to finish up, uh, making this a bit more broader, this finding. But essentially what we found, what Gülchin found is that there are basic residues in the linker region. And the linker region itself is very important for both regulating spontaneous release, evoked release and release kinetics. And this residue is important for this palmitol acyl transferase enzyme to actually implement palmitol fatty acid chains to the to the transmembrane domain of syntaxin. And having them present here affects the way how vesicles, once they're primed, can go on fusion. They can be calcium triggered or they can fuse spontaneously. And the energy barrier for going to these directions can be sort of de dependent, are dependent on this uh, post-translational modifications we see here. Okay, so, um, so that was one thing they said, okay, that's a new model, new mechanism, how snare proteins are modulated by nature to have a specific function, okay? But is this really something very specific for here or is it just a kind of a freakish thing? Maybe it's kind of a um, 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 household function. So um, we, we noticed something um, looking at a different synapse system. So there are two, major types of synapses in the brain. They are the phasically releasing synapses and the chronically releasing synapses. The phasic releasing synapses is the one that I told you about. They mainly respond to action potentials. The chronically releasing synapses, <coughs> and essentially the release activity is dependent, um, uh, linearly dependent on the membrane potential of the cell. And this is something you find at the ribbon synapses uh, in the both in the photoreceptors and the bipolar cells of the retina. So then you have essentially um, um, the, the member, the, the photoreceptor measures membrane potential and then varies its release activity according to, to, to the membrane potential. So you have a light flash in the photoreceptors. This causes the cell to hy hyperpolarize. And because when it's hyperpolarized, you have less calcium influx to the calcium channel, you have essentially no release. But in darkness, these, these ribbon synapses are highly active 
uh, because the membrane itself is depolarized. You see the membrane noise here because there's massive release activity happening chronically because the cell is chronically depolarized. So we have here two different synapses. Here we have kind of a conveyor belt system where lots of vesicles kind of sort of fed onto the release sites because you have massive release activity in these uh, ribbon synapses, and they only stop when the cell hyperpolarizes induced by light flash. And uh, so these ribbon synapses actually use a different syntaxin. They use syntaxin 3B compared to the syntaxin 1 that we find in phasically syn releasing synapses, which are sort of downstream of the photoreceptor activity, and of course, in the rest of most of the, the rest of the most of the brain. And so we said, oh, interesting. So there are different syntaxins. And if you look at the structure of syntaxin 1 versus syntaxin 3, it's isoform that is unique for <coughs> synapses. At our famous site, we actually have a glutamic, glutamic acid and not a, a lysine. And so the prediction would be that uh, syntaxin 3b is undergoing different uh, um, changes in, in post-translation magnification uh, in compared to syntaxin 1. So we thought, let's look at syntaxin 3b behavior in a phasically releasing synapse. The other way around, we, we haven't done, because we're not experts in retinal physiology. It's not, not trivial to measure from retina, uh, you know, light responses and so on. You have to do it in the dark. It's super complicated. So we stick with our simple cell culture model and studied what is syntaxin 3b doing in a regular phasic, uh, phasically releasing synapses. So we made sure we can express this protein properly, that it enters the synapses just like the syntaxin 1. They, they go where they're supposed to go. And we introduced also mutation syntaxin 3b to make it like syntaxin 1a. Okay, so, so making the rutamate back to lysine. And so then we looked at synaptic transmission. And this is a wild-type evoked response for syntaxin 1. This is a wild-type response for syntaxin 3b. It's essentially gone. But if you just make the same single point mutation at position, boom, we get back synaptic transmission. So in, in the case of syntaxin 3b, this residue is much, much more important than what we found in syntaxin 1. It's because changing this charge, at least in a phasic synapse, is kind of a go, no go in terms of release. Okay. And um, uh, so that was clear to us that there has been something going on in evolution between that syntaxin 1 and 3b sort of diverted uh, in their structure and then uh, sort of mediating different types of release activity. Um, we could also, we also took then the sister of syntaxin 3b, which is syntaxin 3a, the splice variant of syntaxin 3b. And in fact, that splice variant is mainly uh, in the C-terminal part. And this, uh, for example, lacks the cysteines. It's, you see it here, three A has here two valents, not two cysteines. And in fact, it has at this position uh, a, a neutral amino acid and uh, glutamine um, <clears throat> compared to the lysine and syntaxin one. And so we, we gradually went back and sort of changed linker region, transmembrane region of syntaxin 3A uh, and thought, how is it actually affecting protein structure and function? Uh, when we, once we put the linker region and the cysteines into position, we got again a shift of the band size of syntaxin 3A up, indicating we reintroduced palmitylation in this protein simply by putting these structures in. And release was also very interesting. So syntaxin 3 rescues, you see a much smaller response and also the release is much slower. So, uh, so syntaxin 3 is not designed to be a very rapid releasing sna uh, snare. Um, uh, so the fastest releasing snare is the syntaxin 1, which you find in the phasically releasing synapses. And, but we can remake uh, re re this synapse to be releasing efficiently and rapid by simply uh, you know, converting this region here to, to be syntaxin 1a-like. Okay, so we can really play with this and understand that these different, the syntaxin 3a, by the way, is postsynaptically located. So in that postsynapse of a neuron, you also have vesicle fusion. This vesicle fusion is actually important for long-term potentiation. People have found this. And here we can say that whatever the syntaxin 3a property is, it is slightly different than what we know from syntaxin 1a. Uh, 
um, that it is actually not very good in, in phasic release. But what it does, actually, it, it shows much higher frequency of spontaneous release um, compared to, there's something in the syntaxin 3a structure that makes spontaneous release much, much higher than what we see in syntaxin 1a. Um, and, um, and if you look at this, the, the reach in this opens up a new, air, new, new domain that makes us interested in spontaneous release, which is the last half of the snare motif. Because if you we convert syntax in 3a to be like syntax in 1a, by making all these changes to the C terminus, we, we have higher release activity compared to, to syntax in 1a. And what is really different here is this region, is, is this C terminal part of the snare motif. So somehow in part of this snare motif, we have another region that controls spontaneous release activity, okay? You see, you can almost en endlessly study these molecules and find more and more kind of phenotypes and that helps you ultimately understand how these snare machines actually operate, how they control spontaneous activity and, uh, and evoked release. And uh, we even found something similar also for another isoform syntaxin 2, which is very, very cool to work with because it has an even larger effect of spontaneous release. And again, here we found that the C-terminal portion of the snare motif is critical in controlling spontaneous release because if you put simply the C terminal portion of syntaxin two into syntaxin one, you get a massive increase in spontaneous release activity. Uh, and uh, what is different between the syntaxin one and syntaxin two in this region are only a few amino acids. Okay? You can just look at them, they, most of them conserved up, but a few are different and they look outside of the snare motif. The snare motif itself is highly charged on the surface, lots of positive and negative charges, and so ne positive negative charges means they are capable of interacting electrostatically with either membranes or proteins. And there's a famous protein that has been actually crystallized to work, interact with the snare complex, which is again coming back to synaptotagmin that Yuki studied. And um, so synaptotagmin actually interacts exactly with the region that is different between syntaxin one and syntaxin two uh, here. And, we know that syntax, synaptotagmin clamps, blocks spontaneous release. So it's not only a calcium sensor for fast release, it also suppresses spontaneous release. It has kind of a dual function. So we now testing this hypothesis, we're just doing this now, whether this interaction that we, we, we think play a role in, in spontaneous release is actually um, mediated by interacting with synaptotagmin. And by, you know, where in syntaxin one, you have this crucial two, um, aspartic acid 231, which is mutated in syntaxin two, um, and, you know, enabling the, uh, in syntaxin one, enabling the interaction syntaxin one, synaptotagmin, and therefore clamping spontaneous release activity. Um, and yeah, so we are, this seemed to be the case. We have, we are making mutations in this to make it like syntaxin two like, and again, boom, you see the mini frequency goes up. And uh, we are collaborating with <clears throat> people like Axel Brunger or Jose Rizzo, which is really trying to understand this process better on kind of a molecular simulation and uh, structural level. Okay, I'm coming to my last summary slide. Thank you for your patience. I know lots of data. Um, so um, what I wanted to show you is that synaptic release has really multiple components. We see evoked release, we have spontaneous release. Mostly the spontaneous release is undesirable because it creates noise. And, but you can see that this kind of activity differs in different brain areas. And this maybe in some areas, uh, spontaneous release might be actually a good thing because you not, don't need a phasic nickel. You, you want to maybe have like a dribbling, continuous dribbling of, of vesicle fusion happening. And so, um, you know, this can, may play a role, for example, in, if you're looking at the eye or at the, in the cortex. Um, and this diversity in release contributes to sort of helps to shape how synapses actually compute. Do we have a phasic release activity? Do we have high release probability or low release probability, depression, facilitation? Or do we want to actually have chronic release that we need, for example, for a ribbon synapse to convey it, to do its job? So this is, we know this is taking place and we really think that synapses are like in neurons and, and their firing 
synapses are speaking different dialects, and that has some implication under the of the machinery that underlies these processes. So we know that the core proteins that are forming the release apparatus, as well as accessory proteins like complexin or synaptotagment, are uh, have evolved to adapt to these unique properties to make make let's say phasic release very efficient or chronically release very efficient. And we can see that, for example, comparing different syntax and isoforms. And we think that overall uh, understanding the mechanism, how um, uh, uh, how this diversity of function takes place requires that we understand how these proteins also interact with other proteins. And uh, so that, in, or, or other molecules such as phospholipids, uh, how a fatty acid anchor that we found in syntaxin one is sort of interacting with a membrane or how calcium sensors like synaptotagment or complexin can interact directly with the snare complex. And those are the key modulators for this uh, fusion apparatus to sort of do these jobs up here. Okay, that brings me to the end. This is uh, one, most of the work that I showed you it was done by Gülchin Wader. Um, she has, uh, Andrea Salazar has sort of taken over this project. And we have some older studies on syntax in Zhong Xiaohua. Marie Ferran Chilo did the titration experiment. Zina and Estelle are currently working on this interaction between the snare complex and uh, 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 synaptotagmin. And Jana has done this beautiful CRI-M data that I showed you before. And we have some really key collaborators for this. Eric Jorgensen introduced me to this high pressure, uh, fast uh, fresh and freeze technology. Jose Rizzo is a long time collaborator and working particular questions of structure and function. And Tom, Zutov and Niels Brose have been also long-term collaborators working with genetic mouse models involving presynaptic proteins. And thank you for your patience. I know it was a long, lot of data, a lot of time, and uh, thank you.